Hello everyone, thanks for checking out this webinar on finding balance, giving clients what they want and what they really need. If you have ever had, and I know you've had, clients that want to get trained really hard for whatever reason, but they are a movement nightmare, this is going to be a great webinar for you to get some tips and tricks and to kind of see what we do with Smart Group Training with those kind of people. So let's get started. If you don't know me, I'll just go over this real quick. Uh, my name's Steve Long. Uh, I have 10 plus years experience in the industry. I own a gym in St. Louis called Complete Fitness Results, the co-owner of Smart Group Training with Jared Williver. I also work with uh, Functional Movement Systems as a assistant and lead instructor. Was voted top five best personal trainers in St. Louis a while back. Uh, top five best boot camp instructors, and a top 25 industry rising star in 2011. Was also voted Fitness Entrepreneur of the Year. I've uh, been in some books and different publications. I've consulted with major universities and strength conditioning programs, and I'm also a program advisory board member on a local college here in St. Louis. Today's goals, I want to, well, our, our goals are always with Smart Group Training to improve the quality of the group fitness training in our industry by making it more individualized. So with everything that we do, that is our main goal is to help make group training just a, a, a notch better by taking the, the more general approach and just making it a little bit more individualized for each client to make sure that you're not only getting them the best results but making sure that you're keeping them as safe as possible. Uh, and today specifically uh, I want to show some ways to provide fun and intense workouts while at the same time improving movement quality and preventing injuries. So let's get started with that. So this is what clients think they need. We all have had these people who want to work as hard as they possibly can till they're laying on the ground in a puddle of sweat, puking, and you know just completely annihilated from their workouts. Um, a lot of people think that they have to do this every workout uh, to get results, but honestly what we know is that most of those people really need some good sleep, a solid nutrition plan, and some really good base of strength training and functional movement. So smart group training is about finding that balance between what clients want and what clients need by giving them high intensity workouts but doing it responsibly. So in order to do that the first thing that needs to be done is to make sure you're doing a movement screen before you train the client. Um, that's definitely one of the most important parts of the system is to make sure that we get a good idea of how the person moves and that's how we're going to program design is knowing how the person moves ahead of time. So getting a good screen is vital and we use the functional movement screen because of the fact that it is a well established system already. It's easy to learn. It's quick you can easily do it in groups. There's a lot of research on it. Um, it's just a, a really good standard in which to judge movement that I think that everyone should kind of speak that language and we can all get on the same page with what movement looks like by using the functional movement screen. So we definitely use the movement screen as that first, um, you know, assessment that we take people through to see if we need to dig deeper. Sometimes we dig deeper with some with some more um, with deeper assessments. Sometimes we refer out, but we definitely get a screen when they first come in, and that's how we're going to start making our decisions. So, since once we have a screen, we can basically determine which patterns we want to avoid. If we have painful patterns, um, you know, any major medical stuff going on with any joints, anything like that. That's when we want to refer out to a clinician. Um, if we can refer out to an SFMA clinician, that helps us uh, be on the same page, knowing that that person is going to be more um, 
app to understand the functional movement screen and understand what we're trying to do with the client. So once we get that screen, we can find the zeros that are on the functional movement screen and we know those are the patterns that we're not going to mess with whenever we're training the client. Step three is determine which patterns to correct. So if someone has a one on a movement on the functional movement screen, which means there's a dysfunction or some sort of compensation, then those are the patterns that we're going to use those are the patterns that we're going to use corrective exercises on in order to try to get those patterns to be, um, you know, to the standard that's set by the functional movement screen. Uh, then step four is going to be to determine which patterns we can train really hard. So that's what's cool about the movement screen. You got the zeros, one, two, three. We know that the zeros we're going to avoid, refer out if we can, see if we can get those things fixed up. The ones, those are the things that we're going to correct. We want to make sure that we're clearing those things over time and, and, uh, and getting those to become patterns that we can eventually smash and give people the harder exercises, the, more, the harder strength exercises, the harder conditioning exercises, um, knowing that the pattern is going to be a good movement pattern. We're not going to cause any more compensation and we're not going to put them at risk for injury. So... Uh, I want to talk about some ways to incorporate what we learn from the screen into actual program design. And I use this slide here just to kind of throw in my, my two cents on uh, how just random exercise selection is not at all what we're trying to do. And like I, I've seen people using like decks of cards and, and honestly I've done it in the past with people I know are in, in, in really good shape you know, like fun games and things with people. And, it, you know, it makes it fun and that's cool to do every once in a while, but that's not program design and that's not what we're trying to accomplish with smart group training. We're trying to accomplish a more individualized program. So the first thing I want to talk about is correcting the weak link only. So if you have somebody go through a functional movement screen or whatever screen that you might want to use and they have a lot of different things going on, then you really only want to work on one thing at a time as far as your corrective strategy so it doesn't become like a giant corrective exercise only program design. So you don't want to spend your entire workout doing a breathing and correctives. Uh, you want to make sure that you're giving the people some exercises to challenge them and, and get them, you know, doing some of the more challenging exercises along with some of the corrective exercises but really trying to knock out one thing at a time and not all of them at once. So uh, some good ways to do that are spend a lot of time in the warm-up attacking the weakest link. Um, that's a good time to really focus on the correctives because you're kind of doing some of the slower stuff anyway and building up. So it's, um, it's easy to, to throw in the correctives in that part. It kind of just makes more sense in the client's mind and you can really hammer out working on the weakest link. And then sprinkle some correctives in throughout the workout also and we're going to talk about different ways to do that and then from there you just red light any other dysfunctional patterns and then correct them later so red lighting means that you know say they have like you know four different um, uh, jacked up movement patterns you're going to work on one movement pattern the one that could potentially help all of the movement patterns um, and then you're going to you're going to red light the other three by not doing exercises in that pattern that are going to cause them more harm than good. And we'll get more into that also. Next, it's really important to be meticulous about form. Um, the proper exercise selection is in, in a group setting is not easy. Uh, doing the functional movement screen and screening ahead of time makes it a lot easier, but it still doesn't mean you're going to be finding the exact perfect exercise for that person. It could mean that you find the right exercise, but it still doesn't mean they're going to be perfect at the exercise. It means they can do it, but it doesn't mean they can do it well. They're still going to need to be coached. And you really need to just make sure that that's in the culture of your training and your group training to be running around like a madman or woman, correcting form as much as possible instead of just being a cheerleader. So you know, there's a big difference between the plank at the top with the hip sagging and the plank at the bottom where the person is in a good aligned position 
and just making those little tweaks in a class setting or a large group setting or any group setting at all where people go from coasting to feeling it, um, I mean, that's going to establish you as a great trainer and you're just going to make sure you're getting the clients the best results. I mean, I don't think I need to talk too much on the benefits of making sure your clients are in good form, but being meticulous in a group setting is, uh, is a must. Use alternates instead of correctives. So a lot of times we have the group workout or a template kind of pre-written of how we want it to go. And then we're going to either, you know, we're going to avoid it, correct it, or train it. So we could come to a situation where we need to correct almost everything, but it doesn't mean that you can't just use an alternate instead. So in you know these pictures, there's the girl here on the left doing a bad squat. So if we have a squat station in a group setting, we could either A, find a squat that she could do, B, do a mobility or exercise to help fix her squat, or we could just completely do a different exercise and do like a deadlift, or we could do a conditioning exercise, something simple like ropes. So a lot of times, instead of just doing a bunch of correctives, you can find quick little alternates that people can do in a group setting instead to make sure they're still getting their heart rate up, still um, breaking down muscle fiber, still getting that metabolic effect, but um, not doing any exercise is going to cause them more harm than good. Um, another way we like to do it is by supersetting hard exercises with correctives. So I talked earlier about sprinkling correctives into the workout, and this is a really good way to do it because you can find an exercise that is uh, high intensity and then during the recovery period you can just have them do a corrective for their weakest link so that's a good way to make sure that they're maximizing their recovery and still getting in correctives at the same time and then the same thing here applies sandwich high, intens high intensity exercises between simple exercises so this would be like a tri-set of putting like a really hard exercise in between two exercises that are a little bit easier. Same thing, increases the intensity but allows time to recover, um, allows for shorter rest periods, and it's a way to, how uh, Brett Jones said this in a seminar that I was uh, helping him on, he said sometimes you gotta hide the broccoli in the fruit smoothie. And it's just kinda, you know, splicing in the correctives and kinda sneaking them in. And, uh, and so that way, you know, they're doing the harder exercises and they're getting the, the, you know, the effect of that. And then the correctives, you know, seem like they're, like it's more challenging. Uh, you know, as long as they're recovered enough to do the corrective exercise as well, it makes it for a whole lot harder feel and a whole lot, um, you know, more intense exercise session for them. Smash the core. So a good way to train people hard that have a lot of dysfunctions is to really zero in on the core. So primitive patterns are a good way to do that because they don't cause harm, they keep people sweaty, and they potentially correct things. So like for an example, crawling is a great exercise that is going to potentially you know, give them you know, good core stability, good reciprocal patterning, build up some, some other patterns. But at the same time, like bear crawling is extremely difficult and people that want to get smashed, are, they're definitely love to hate bear crawls. So that's a good one. Um, a way to make some of these basic exercises harder, like dead bugs and bird dogs and things, is to hold the exercise and then cycle a breath at end range to increase the difficulty. And I have a video here of me doing a not-so-wonderful bird dog, but it shows a good example. So here's some of the bird dogs we've seen in a lot of classes. People just ripping through it, just going through the motions. But when you really get your form dialed in, you stabilize your core, you get in good positions, and then you hold it, and then right there, taking a big diaphragmatic breath, and then exhaling, and getting all the air out, and then holding before coming back to the position, that'll get people really shaken and really getting their core turned on. And it just makes the exercise a lot harder to them. But at the same time, I mean, this is a, this is a bird dog. So they're gonna get a lot of basic core stability 
and core work out of this and it's going to feel hard for them without having to knock out like you know weighted sit-ups and, and really hardcore core exercises that they might not be ready for at this time so another thing is to use self-limiting exercises so self-limiting exercises basically to, to, to sum it up are exercises that you can't do wrong very long because before you get to a point to where you're going to hurt yourself you're just going to fail at the exercise by not doing it well anymore so for example like bear crawls you have minimal horrible form on those before the people just get tired jump rope you know before you get bad form you just get bad at jumping the rope the rope hits your feet farmer carries your you can see your posture would be the only thing that would start to slip and you know your hands usually are the things that give out before your form and your core bottoms up kettlebell stuff I mean like carries and presses and anything like get ups with the uh, kettlebell uh, with the bottom up um, if it starts your form gets bad or anything the kettlebell falls down you know that you're you're not doing the exercise perfectly climbing balance beam stuff Indian clubs all good examples of exercises that if you start getting tired you start getting your form starts to suffer you just cannot do the exercise anymore correctly and it fails that's a good way to you know splice in these exercises in your program design makes it easy for you to manage because you know that you're not gonna have people getting into really bad form uh, modify stuff to clean it up so a good example is to uh, like on the push-ups having people doing push-ups from the floor you know if they get a one on the push-up on the FMS or they just have bad push-ups uh, good ways to make the intensity still high and make sure that they feel like they're doing the exercise is to make modifications so on the push-up like elevating the hands makes it a lot easier or strapping a band underneath your waist to help pull you up out of the push-up um, you know same thing with like chin-ups the band assisted chin-ups or RNT squats anything that assists the exercise to where it's still the exercise but you just made it easier so like core pre-engaged things I mean anything that you can do to, to where they still feel like they're doing the exercise but it's just a small assist it's gonna help clean up their form it's gonna help keep the intensity high and um, and make sure that they're actually correcting that pattern all at the same time so uh, those simple modifications go a long way and it's good to have those modifications built into your program design ahead of time so you know like if you have a push-up station that you're gonna have different regressions and progressions on that station so you'll have push-up you'll have elevated push-up band push-up um, and then you might have like a harder version for people that are mastering the floor push-ups then you know for the people that have um, you know one on the movement screen they're going to be doing the elevated uh, or the band assisted the modifications the people that are twos and threes are going to either be knocking them out on the floor or they're going to be doing like the spider-man push-ups or whatever so that's how the screen ties back into the exercise selection you'll know what exercise you should give them at that station based on their screen use finishers that are not complex movements so snatches jump squats are great but not when you're tired so we want to make sure that the complex movements are going to be more when people have the energy to do them correctly and at the end when we're really smashing people hard for that conditioning finisher which I, I mean in a group class uh, if it's if it's at all fat loss fitness related I think finishers are, are a necessity especially if you're doing a lot of corrective stuff during the strength portion you want to make sure that you're, you're throwing down some hard finishers at the end so people can get that I just did a good workout feeling you know they need to have that feeling or they end up not coming back if that's their goal so throwing in those finishers are a great way to do that and things like rope um, dynamic step ups that's what we call that bob um, jogging running whatever jumping rope airdyne bike uh, upper body running which is just tall kneeling and moving your arms um, elevated modifications carries sleds um, are a great way to get people smoked without a whole lot of bad form kneeling medicine ball slams, crawling, uh, different Turkish get-up progressions, uh, supine rope pulls where you're laying on your back and you're pulling a rope with like a heavy weight or like a heavy kettlebell or a sled at the end, um, and different rope pull progressions. Those are all exercises that are super simple exercises that are really hard to mess up your form. 
that you can do at a super high intensity and not jack anything up. So uh, you want to make sure that you're doing those more simple exercises in the finisher because they're going to be really tired. And if they're really tired, you want to make sure they're not doing complex exercises so they don't end up hurting themselves. And this, we, we try to find alternates instead of correctives in the finisher. We don't want people doing correctives in the finisher. So that's definitely the time to find alternates or modifications. Uh, sometimes having multiple class options is a good idea or, or a necessity for certain um, trainers or facilities depending on um, the way you have, have to run your program. So um, we mainly just have one type of class where we blend everybody in and everybody's goal is you know fat loss and fitness. Um, but sometimes it's best if you have two separate options, one that's more for um, strength, <clears throat> excuse me, strength which is, you know, corrective and strength-based, and one that's more of your um, conditioning, muscular endurance, kind of, you know, ripping it harder type class. So, you know, we've, we've had functional strength and metabolic fusion. We know if somebody's really jacked up and they're going into classes, we want to put them in a functional, functional strength first. Um, and people know that uh, metabolic fusion is going to be where people are working really hard and their goal is to get in the best shape possible. So I want to go over a couple of case studies of, of how this works very easily. Uh, this first case study is just someone who's just got, who's not very jacked up at all. They just have a couple of ones on the screen and the different modifications you would make based on their screen to write their program. So um, this example, I just randomly picked ones out of there, um, and I put an inline lunge and a rotary stability one. So this person um, has some sort of issue with the lunge, obviously, and has some sort of uh, issue with their core. So this is the type of workout that we would have that we would write for them specifically. Uh, the warm up, you know, that's going to be focused in on uh, the weakest link which is going to be the rotary stability. So we want to make sure we're hitting that rotary stability pretty hard in the warm-up, and we want to make sure we're red lighting anything for the lunges. So um, in the warm-up, we got lower rolling and bird dogs for the um, rotary stability. Those are correctives for that, the three-month breathing also. So uh, dial in the breathing, dial in that inner core with the lower rolling and the bird dogs. And then we're just getting into more of a you know, I threw in the half kneeling chop just because, <clears throat> or the half kneeling hip flexor stretch because of the inline lunge. This is if we can work on that mobility, uh, that's not a bad idea. And then keeping them in half kneeling for the chops to kind of lock in some stability. Then split stance rotations because with this warm up, I'm basically taking people from the ground up, from supine to rolling to to uh, the crawling position to the kneeling position, and then the different stances once you are uh, on your feet, split stance and bilateral stance. Um, throwing in a stride stance would be a good idea in there also. So with that warm-up, we're, we're doing that, taking them from the ground up, and we're really working in on the weakest link, which is the rotary stability. And then just an example of a strength workout, you know, we're good to have to squat the guy. Um, on, on, the, on this particular workout, where it would be a lunge, is going to be a half kneeling something, because uh, we want to get that, we want to red light the lunge and put in a half kneeling stability or mobility exercise depending on what the issue is and then on tricep two simple uh he's good on the push-ups we're doing bird dogs for the corrective to work on the weakest link and then throwing in some assisted chin-ups so this guy's going to get a pretty good strength workout here um with that and yet he's still going to work on his issues and then for conditioning we just do a quick alternating set 2010 of rope waves and shuffle he's going to be fine doing those exercises he's going to get his heart rate up he's going to be feeling um like he accomplished something like he's accomplishing his goals and he's still going to be doing a a, a, a solid workout working on his particular issues that he has uh, this next example case study <coughs> is kind of the point of what we're talking about today someone that's pretty jacked up they got ones and zeros on everything this is kind of like your nightmare whenever you screen someone and they only want to do group training. It's the only thing that's in their budget. That's what they came for and they're ready to rip it in group training and you're like, oh, man. So 
Um, you know, we run into that a lot, unfortunately. So we, we try to make sure that we can have people work, all people train in our group training. It doesn't always work that way. Sometimes we have to have them do some semi-private first, or if you have like the functional strength class, you can do something like that. But sometimes if with the right program design, we can get these people training in a group and feeling not bad about themselves like they were too jacked up to actually work out. So this case study, the warm-up is um, a lot of it is going to be corrective based. A lot of it's going to be on the ground. We're still going from the ground up, starting in um, supine with the breathing, supine pelvic tilts, that tills it says, but it should be tilts, <laughs> um, to get the, the pelvis moving and just get that uh, motor control down and get some core activation leg lowering for the active straight leg raise issue, um, you know, rib roll for the um, shoulder mobility issue, prone what's that back deer, that is an exercise for um, thoracic rotation and extension. So we're really working a lot more here on the mobility stuff with, with someone like that. Um, and then we want to throw in some basic core stability in the warm up with the bird dogs and half kneeling rotations. And then we're just going to continue to work on the leg raise pattern more with the toe touch progressions too if that person um, has an issue touching their toes. And we want to get them up on their feet doing something and a toe touch progression is a good corrective for them to get them up on their feet. So um, to get this person the most intense workout even though they're completely jacked up, we're going to throw in some uh, alternating sets here where we're going to basically be supersetting an exercise that's a little bit harder with an exercise that's more corrective based. So a low box step up, as long as it's not a super high step, that person can get some good um, you know, lower body strength or, or conditioning out of a low box step up. And then we're going to do a core engaged leg raise to work on that leg raise pattern. And then the second alternating set, something simple like a band row, it's hard to mess up. Um, if you know, maybe a limited range of motion, and then uh, bird dog legs to superset with that. So, you know, we're not having a whole bunch of rest in between these exercises. So just going through like the row and the bird dog, the row and the bird dog, the row and the bird dog without a whole lot of rest. You know, you're not you're not doing anything that's going to cause that client more harm than good, and you're actually starting to kind of work on some basic stability there. And then the third one, we're going to smash the core. Uh, with some basic stuff though, and we're it's, this is a good time to um, smash the core, good time to cycle those breaths with dead bugs. You know, you can reach the legs out, cycle that breath, bring it back in, that smashes the core pretty hard, and then bear crawl, which, you know, is that primitive pattern that builds, like I said earlier, uh, builds up that, that uh, those primitive patterns, smashes the core, and smashes them um, at the same time as far as the feeling of of like they just got their butt kicked because bear crawls are hard. Then for conditioning, uh, step overs. So just like a lateral step over on a low box real quick. And then kneeling um, waves, rope waves, with just like one strand of the rope instead of both at the same time, assuming this person's deconditioned. Um, so that's, that's a pretty simple workout. I mean, there's not a whole lot of stuff you can mess up in this workout. But at the same time, if you're limiting the rest in between sets, if someone is you know wanting to wanting to work out real hard this this can be a pretty a pretty tough workout for someone that is completely jacked up and they're still going to get a lot of benefit as far as fixing that stuff that's jacked up so you're getting the best of both worlds here and you're not doing anything that's going to cause them more harm than good and here's an example of like a group training workout and how we would make modifications for people um instead of like a, a completely individualized program design. So we have the red, yellow, green alternate boxes here set up. Um, so basically if someone had a one on the functional movement screen, they would automatically go into the red box on this and we would need to correct it. Or they would shoot over it all the way to the right and go into the alternate box and do an alternate as long as they don't have a one for whatever's in the alternate box. But the alternate box literally could be anything that we want it to be. It's just that we're trying to kind of predetermine what we want this workout to look like ahead of time, and then we make the modifications based on you know, the needs of the client. 
So if someone is good to squat, we got a single arm kettlebell front squat, or if you know if they're just learning how to squat, we're gonna have them doing the goblet squats. If uh, they have a one on the squat on the movement screen, we're either gonna have them do like a, a heels elevated goblet to get around any issues they have so they can be squatting, or we're gonna do a mobility exercise to try to work, work on the squat. It really depends on the client's needs and, and the client's goals and how hard they wanna work out. If they want to work on their stuff, then you give them the mobility stuff. If they're trying to lose 20 pounds in some time, in, in, in a short time frame for a specific event, or they're trying to gain muscle, or they're trying to get in shape for a some, you know, some sort of specific event, then you might want to give them alternates. So if they can do a split squat at that station because their, their lunge is good, or a step up, then we're good to go with that too in a group situation. Um, then next we have suspended row. If, um, if their form's horrible or they have a one on the, um, shoulder mobility, then you could either give them a shoulder mobility exercise. You could drop it down to a simple exercise like a band row. Um, another thing you could do is an alternate in that position. Uh, single leg glute bridge. There's not a whole lot of red lights for single leg glute bridge. It's a very basic foundational exercise that most people can do. Um, if there was any issue with that, you would just find an alternate. Then we're going to throw in rope waves. Um, not a whole lot of uh, red lighting on that either. You just make it easier by having them have a single strand, or you can just throw in an alternate, have them like run in place, shuffle, anything like that. And then the, net, the last exercise is mountain climber. So if someone doesn't have the core stability because they have a one on the trunk stability push-up or the rotary stability, then we might want to drop them down to um, an elevated and simple. I mean, they're still getting a lot of the benefits of the mountain climber. We're just going to put them in position where they can have good control of their core while they're doing it and good control of their scapula, their cervical spine, and everything. We want good form while they're doing it. And we'll just elevate them until we find that the form they can do it well in and then let them do it. They're just going to do it a little bit slower and controlled. Um, sometimes we just want to give them an alternate that they can do something and we'll, we'll have them do lateral bounding. Sometimes it's real quick little bounds. If, if someone, you know, we don't want them doing power stuff. And sometimes it might be longer bounds too. So we just make the tweaks based on whatever someone has on the screen um, in that workout. And we can do that very easily just by color coding the functional movement screen and giving them bracelets to wear on their wrists that um, correspond to any ones that they would have on the screen. So for example, if someone had a one on the squat, we would give them a purple bracelet. So when they come to the squat station, we would say, if you have a purple bracelet, go ahead and do the heels elevated or do your squat corrective. Or um, And if you're not, we'll just go ahead and start with a goblet squat and work our way into one arm kettlebell squats. So quick summary. People think they need to be smashed, but really they need moderate intensity exercise and a little bit less stress. So we want to we want to give them some hardcore workouts, and we also want to make sure we're educating them on um, on recovery. Uh, if you're not assessing, you're guessing. So the, all of this was made possible by doing the screen ahead of time. Uh, without the screen, it's just kind of you know it it's sloppy. <laughs> Um, only correct the weakest link. You don't want to spend your whole time correcting every single thing they have going on. Work on one thing and then alter use alternates for the other stuff. Make sure you're doing uh, red lighting. Be meticulous on form. That goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, use alternates instead of correctives at times. Um, sometimes you're going to want to use a corrective. Sometimes you're going to want to use an alternate. You're going to have to use your best judgment on that based upon the client's needs and and desires. Uh, superset hard exercises with correctives. It's a great way to squeeze in correctives after hard exercise to make sure uh, people are getting the best of both worlds. Hide the broccoli in the fruit smoothie, so sandwich in um, harder exercises in between more simple exercises. Smash the core and use breath cycling to make it even harder and more effective. Use self-limiting exercises to make sure people can't go into bad form. Modify exercises to simplify them, so um, things like the elevating the push-ups, using the band assist. 
Uh, finish, use finishers that have exercises that are easy to do, but make you sweaty and tired. Because people want to get sweaty and tired, they relate that to to um, to a good workout, and we want to make sure that they get that. But we want to make sure they're doing it responsibly. So um, making sure you're not doing complex exercises and finishers, but simple things that that get you tired, and make sure that you're getting some good conditioning in. And sometimes you may have to have multiple class options. And, and if that works for your particular situation, that's cool either way. And then some final thoughts. Uh, you cannot make things up as you go. You have to have a plan. You have to have a system in place. You have to have this kind of thought out ahead of time uh, in order to make it work. This, the screen and, and the systems are what make this possible so make sure that you have a good system and then you have to educate your clients that getting smashed is not the goal but getting results is the goal and they don't necessarily always coincide so we we want to make sure we're giving them some of the harder workouts we want to we want to mix those in with some easier workouts and we want to let them know that not every workout needs to be a 10 out of 10 you want to do those nine or ten workouts you know you want to do those but you don't do them every single workout and we all know this, but our clients don't know this, and we have to tell them more than once. So it needs to be a, a part of your education to your clients, letting them know that, number one, you can't smash the bad patterns no matter what. And then number two, you don't always just want to smash yourself. So the education is huge. Um, for more information on us and, or our program design or our systems, you can check out our website, smartgrouptraining.com. Uh, we have a, a product called the Smart Group Training System, which is basically how to incorporate the functional movement screen into group training. It also has all the programs done for you, um, tons of videos of all the exercises. I mean, it's a complete laid out system in order to incorporate what we're doing in our group training into your group training quickly. Uh, and you can check that out at smartgrouptraining.com backslash system if you're interested. Or you can go to our products page and check out the other things, like Building a Foundation is a product. Um, it's a resource that's basically uh, everything that, that incorporates everything that we're talking about here. It, it's whenever your client is all mangled up and you need to get them built up, this is our step-by-step -step approach on how to build someone up from the ground up. And um, we've heard a lot of really good things about this. Uh, from a lot of really smart people, so something we're really proud of. The B3 bundle is basically if you're limited on equipment and want to use a smart group training system, it's a lot of great ideas. It's also just a lot of really good tools for your corrective exercise arsenal and some good program design ideas in there too for a really good price. Uh, we also have a certification that um, if you're wanting to learn from us live and get certified in what we do, um, I mean, we really do well live on teaching people things. Sometimes just going through the exercises, the way we teach them is some of the biggest benefits. You know, a lot of times we hear, you know, I'm doing the corrections, but they're just not working. Well, when we can work with you one-on-one, -on -one, or not one-on-one, -on -one, but when we can work with you in a group and show you the exercises and coach you like we would a client and then teach you how we incorporate all this into your specific situation, then the certification is a really great option. And then the mentorship is if, you know, it, it's more, I would say more for the gym owner than the independent trainer, uh, somebody that wants to get their staff all on the same page, get the systems incorporated specifically into their gym. And it, it's almost more of a facility certification. So if you're interested in the mentorship, then that would be, um, something that you would want to do if you are a gym owner. So those are the different ways that we can help you. Um, that's what we love to do. Um, we, we started Smart Group Training uh, just to share what we were doing in our gym. And over the years, we've really found a, a, a passion for, for teaching people what we do and trying to make it easier for them to, to, to make group training more individualized. So if you have any questions, there's some great resources for you. You can always email me with questions at steve at smartgrouptraining.com. Thanks for checking us out.